since May of 1963. Tactical Air Command forces have participated in four joint training maneuvers conducted in the United States by the U.S. Strike Command. The first of these Strike Command maneuvers was held on the Yakima Firing Range in Washington State. Participating elements of this newly organized combat command were divided into two opposing forces and directed to face each other under realistic combat conditions. This was Exercise Cooley Crest. Two months later, in August 1963, the U.S. Strike Command moved the largest military force since World War II into the humid, semi-tropical heat of the Carolinas. This exercise afforded the Tactical Air Command its first opportunity to support, completely by air, massive airborne operations. This was accomplished by a closely coordinated, highly developed tactical air control system, utilizing simultaneously fighters, reconnaissance, and assault airlift. This was Exercise Swift Strike 3. To further improve strike command techniques for swift tactical reaction in any known environment, Elements of STRICOM were deployed again within a period of nine months to the Arctic environment of Alaska, this time in a reinforcement role to bolster the forces of the Alaskan Command. Here under the control of the Alaskan Theater Commander, many of the techniques previously demonstrated were proven operational. Smaller than previous exercises, but nonetheless effective, this Arctic maneuver offered dynamic proof that the equipment and men of Strike Command were tough, deliberate, and adaptable. This was Exercise Polar Siege. The results of Exercises Cooley Crest, Swift Strike Three, and Polar Siege proved beyond doubt practice makes perfect. In the same desert area where 20 years ago General George Patton trained his troops for their rendezvous with immortality, U.S. STRICOM in May of 1964 brought together the largest peacetime contingent of men, tanks, and aircraft ever assembled. This film is a report of the United States Air Force Tactical Air Command's participation in Exercise Desert Strike. Commanded by General Paul D. Adams, Commander United States Strike Command, this exercise covered the spectrum of warfare from employment of conventional weapons through escalation into simulated nuclear conflict. This then is an account of a grueling, dirty, dangerous mock war. The only thing missing was live munitions. War under a merciless desert sun, which bombarded men and machines with temperatures as high as 117 degrees. War with sand and wind, which gnawed away at skin and metal. To provide background and motivation for Desert Strike, two imaginary countries were established, with the Colorado River serving as an international boundary line. Situated west of the Colorado, bordered to the north by Oregon and to the south by Mexico, was the fictional country of Calonia. To the east, occupying the states of Arizona, Utah, part of Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas, was the country of Nizona, Into this vast area of sand and barren mountains, the United States Strike Command deployed 1,000 tanks, 7,000 vehicles, 100,000 men, 800 aircraft. The established ground battle area 
consisting of 13 million acres, straddled the Colorado River. Prior to the outbreak of hostilities, the primary opposing ground forces were deployed to their respective positions within this battle area. In the north, Nizona's ground forces were composed of a mechanized infantry division and an armored division in the south. Across the Colorado River facing these forces was Colonia's one armored division. Charged with the responsibility of Nizona's military strategy and actions was Joint Task Force Phoenix, commanded by Army Lieutenant General Charles G. Dodge. JTF Phoenix had at its disposal, in addition to the two Army divisions, a National Guard Brigade and a Reserve Brigade, six tactical fighter squadrons, one composite tactical reconnaissance squadron, and one assault airlift squadron. Colonia's military arm was represented by Joint Task Force Mojave, commanded by Air Force Lieutenant General Charles B. Westover. Complementing his one armored division were a National Guard armored brigade, four tactical fighter squadrons, one composite reconnaissance squadron, and one assault airlift squadron. With this distribution, Phoenix forces greatly outnumbered Mojave's. Purposely developed for this exercise, this ratio required Mojave to deploy on a wide defensive front. Held in a reserve status by the exercise director to be committed as play of the exercise progressed were an airborne division, six fighter squadrons, and five assault airlift squadrons. Of this total force, tactical air command's commitment was 16 tactical fighter squadrons, two composite tactical reconnaissance squadrons, seven assault airlift squadrons, and six communications and control squadrons. Tactical Air Command provided airlift of its own personnel and equipment. Military Air Transport Service airlifted 13,000 troops of the 101st Airborne Division and their equipment from Fort Campbell, Kentucky to three staging bases in Southern California. primary staging base for the command element of the 101st, as well as a majority of the assault airlift force, was the Kern County Airport, Mojave, California. This bare base, which was just a deserted World War II memory, soon became a completely operational air base. Airport equipment airlifted in included portable GCA units and a tactical air command Gray Eagle package with all facilities and equipment required to sustain this operation. Also airlifted into this bare base was a portable fuel hydrant system. Four 50,000 gallon tanks provided a 24 hour refueling capability. Exercises or wars are not made of combat alone. Men against men, machines against machines. A great deal of administrative and logistic effort is required. This effort was primarily exerted from Needles, California, where a neutral force of 10,000 men, commanded by Brigadier General John M. Finn, was responsible for all logistical support required to sustain the neutral forces and the thousands of mobile combat forces from both sides, which were moving constantly through the large exercise area. Also located at Needles was the Director Headquarters, Joint Control Center, JCC. Here were control teams for both Mojave and Phoenix. Briefers, umpires, analysis teams, and other advisory, scientific, and administrative elements evaluated and controlled the pulse of Desert Strike. One of these elements, the Central Air Traffic Monitoring Facility, was organized especially for this exercise. The task of CATMIF was to ensure the safe and orderly use of airspace for both military and civilian flights within the exercise area. Fragmentary orders and flight plans were examined to determine if dangerous airspace congestion existed. If missions conflicted, priorities were issued by the exercise director. Remarkable realism was achieved by integrating political and economic situations into military planning and functions. To accomplish this, each country had a pseudo-functional war cabinet. 
General Jacob Devers, former Army commander, World War II, was Prime Minister of Nizona. The former Chief of Staff of the Air Force and former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Nathan F. Twining, acted as Colonia's Prime Minister. From the mythical background, the Parker Dam and Davis Dam on the Colorado River had been demilitarized by the Organization of Western States in an effort to control water rights and appease both countries. The river soon became the focal point for explosive action. At dawn Saturday, the 16th of May, Colonia's Joint Task Force Mojave seized the approaches to both dams. Prompted by these actions, Nizona's Prime Minister sent a message to Colonia's Prime Minister, declaring, a state of war now exists. Sunday morning, 17 May, Prime Minister Twining spoke to his countrymen over the Needles radio. I announce with deepest regret that a state of war now exists between the Sona and ourselves. It is a war we did not want. It is a war which the Secretary General of the Organization of Western States and I did our best to prevent, but which the Devers government of Nizona declared upon us early this morning. As Prime Minister Twining spoke, close air support and counter-air missions were being launched by the Mojave Air Force. Within minutes, these missions were speeding toward Nizona air bases in New Mexico, Texas, Nevada, and Arizona. Phoenix Air Forces immediately followed with strikes against Colonia air bases as far west and north as McClellan and Mather in Northern California. The Desert Strike War had begun. Air Defense Command interceptors committed to both countries had the primary responsibility of limiting the effectiveness of enemy air offensive actions against homeland communications zones. While the Tactical Air Command and Air National Guard fighters fought the air battle from border to border over both the communications and combat zones. In this aerial fighting, Air Guard pilots carried their weight with the regulars. During one 24-hour period, for example, an F-86H pilot of the Puerto Rico Air Guard became a double ace. An F-84 pilot from the Ohio Air Guard accounted for six kills. By the 18th of May, in spite of gallant resistance, action was going badly for JTF Mojave. The Phoenix forces, with approximately two to one advantage in ground forces and superior air strength, launched a full-scale attack. situation, and in an effort to stem this drive, JTF Mojave requested additional air elements from the Director Controller's Reserve Forces and permission to use tactical nuclear weapons. Both requests were granted. The first target against which simulated nuclear weapons were used was Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. Anticipating retaliatory nuclear strikes by the Phoenix Air Arm, the Mojave Air Commander ordered his alternate command post activated, a decision which ensured continuity in the control of his forces. This alternate command post demonstrated excellent camouflage technique. It proved virtually undetectable from the air. On the 20th of May, Joint Task Force Mojave placed major emphasis on immediate close air support and directed nuclear weapons to be employed against enemy ground positions. This action seriously impeded Phoenix forces.
reconnaissance effort of both sides, utilizing RF-101 and RB-66 aircraft, varied according to the phase of the exercise. Missions were flown both day and night from Loop and Norton Air Force bases, gathering visual, photographic, and electronic information on installations and movements of opposing task forces. During the pre-hostility phase, reconnaissance aircraft were used primarily for border surveillance to guard against a surprise attack by enemy ground forces. This was accomplished by flying visual and photographic reconnaissance missions. Aircraft on these missions patrolled the river boundary. Their mission was to observe the enemy deep in his own territory without violating the border. This was done by using the technique of high and low altitude oblique photography. As a result of Mojave's concentrated reconnaissance missions, detection was made of an ominous buildup of Phoenix forces along the Colorado River, identifying assault boat assembly sites, pontoon bridge construction, and frenzied Corps of Engineer activity in an obvious prelude to invasion. After initiation of hostilities, the role of tactical air reconnaissance expanded. From first light to last light, RF-101s provided continuous battlefield surveillance to determine enemy location, movement, and disposition. RB-66Cs now penetrated deep into enemy territory on E-Lint ferret missions, successfully detecting enemy control and reporting centers, control and reporting posts, gap filler radars, and all Hawk missile batteries. The excellent desert visibility and the huge columns of dust generated by ground movement of any vehicle resulted in frequent and accurate visual sightings, which were immediately reported by radio to controlling agencies and, when necessary, confirmed photographically. Emphasis was placed on providing immediate response to Army requests for tactical air reconnaissance. When reconnaissance aircraft returned from a mission, the exposed film was rapidly downloaded and rushed to a photo processing cell. While the film was being processed and interpreted by photo intelligence specialists, the pilot was debriefed by intelligence personnel for additional detailed target information. Extracted intelligence from both sources was compiled into a photo intelligence report which was dispatched to higher headquarters for evaluation and further dissemination. In cases where there was an urgent need for photo intelligence information in the field, required prints were placed in canisters, which were rapidly loaded into modified Zuni rocket launchers installed on F-100 fighters. These aircraft then sped the canisters to the front lines, where they were paradropped with pinpoint accuracy. directly to the requesting field commander. Along with normal battlefield surveillance, more sophisticated reconnaissance, utilizing strobe and infrared photographic techniques, drew back the curtain of secrecy surrounding night operations and camouflage activities. Through the use of photo reconnaissance, landing, drop, and extraction zones were selected for assault airlift forces. The majority of airlift forces were assigned to the Mojave JTF. The airlift task force command post was co-located with the tactical air control center. This proved to be a key factor in the excellent control and subsequent reaction of the assault airlift force during the exercise. Landing zones for assault airlift operations were constructed by the 6th Army's Corps of Engineers. Each strip was constructed in an average time of a day and a half. Many of the strips were sprayed with Coherex, an oil resin mixture, which considerably reduced dust problems. In a two-day period, C-130s from Mojave Kern, Point Mabu, and El Toro flew 400 sorties to five of these landing zones. Landing zones were controlled by combat control teams, utilizing mobile control towers and jeep-mounted and backpacked communications equipment. 
during these two days, C-130s moved 3,000 tons of equipment. And over 5,000 troops. A dry lake bed was also used as a landing zone. This LZ had not been worked by engineers, therefore dust preventative had not been used. Here the combat control team utilized a unique offset parallel landing system. This expedited landings, offloading, and takeoffs despite heavy dust conditions. As the battle continued, Reports received by Mojave intelligence indicated the enemy, in haste to extend his salience, had outdistanced and overexerted his capability and was vulnerable to a concerted effort by JTF Mojave forces. Taking advantage of this weakness, JTF Mojave made a decision to commit to the battle area by paradrop the 101st Airborne Division. At dusk, on the eve of the airborne operation, a small diversionary force was airdropped many miles to the south of the primary drop zone. This set the stage for one of the largest single paradrops ever accomplished in a joint exercise. All through the day, during the night, and in the early hours of morning, ground activity at Mojave Kern was intense. Heavy equipment was rigged by TAC Aeroport personnel and loaded aboard C-130s. 463L rough terrain loaders used for the first time in an exercise facilitated loading operations. At the Combat Airlift Support Unit, CALSU, air crews were briefed on details of the mission. Before dawn, paratroopers of the 101st began boarding. Soon afterwards, the airborne strike force was launched. In the sky above the awakening desert, they turned to the east. At first light, an Air Force combat control and Army assault team jumped into a drop zone approximately 25 miles northwest of Needles. Fifteen minutes later, the first of 36 C-130s began dropping heavy equipment. by 28 more C-130s with personnel. In-trail formation technique was used. In a matter of minutes, the airhead was saturated with heavy equipment and over 1,200 combat-ready paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division's Screaming Eagle. Particular importance is the fact that all heavy equipment was dropped without a single malfunction. Later in the day, a combat control team established an extraction zone to receive supplies and equipment by the low altitude parachute extraction system, nicknamed LAPES. Two 10,000 pound pallets were delivered. On one pallet were components of the ground proximity extraction system, known as JEEPS. The combat control team installed the jeeps on another nearby extraction zone. And the following day, 12 extractions by jeeps and lakes were made. All were successful, with no damage sustained by any of the loads. 
the combat control team immediately reported the results of each extraction to the airlift command post at North. Utilizing this combination, continuous extractions at 30 second intervals were made on the same small zone. With the jeep site as the starting point for the first load, subsequent extractions by the LAPES method were possible without having to clear the extraction zone of the previously extracted pallets. The excellent results of this aerial delivery technique prove conclusively that it is operational and ready for inclusion as part of TAC's many weapons systems. With the added force of the 101st Airborne and its immediate link-up with a National Guard Armored Brigade in the Needles area, and with additional fighters assigned to the Mojave Force, providing increased tactical air support, the Phoenix forces were compelled to begin a mass retreat across the Colorado. The end was in sight. All tactical operations ceased on 29 May. The following day, predetermined roll-up plans were implemented. For the first time in a major joint field exercise, Strategic Air Command KC-135 tankers were used. This support enabled both fighter and reconnaissance aircraft to conduct deep penetrations into enemy territory and to remain on air patrol for extended periods of time. An average mission required two refuelings. In some instances, when bases were hit by nuclear strikes, Air Force commanders, by utilizing tankers, kept a large part of their fighter and reconnaissance force airborne until ground contamination was over. Fuel in excess of one million gallons was transferred by KC-135s day and night during the course of the exercise. When improvement becomes a goal for which men and nations strive, when survival itself depends upon constant, unremitting preparation, then the places where this improvement and preparation were spawned should be remembered. Cooley Crest, Swift Strike Three, Polar Sea, and Desert Strike were not historic backgrounds of war, but they were perhaps even more important. For in the years ahead, the world will recall there was a need, and from this need, the United States Strike Command developed a training program so tough, so realistic, that our enemies could not misjudge our determination. Today, there are future joint air-ground exercises being planned. Tomorrow, there will be other names and places to recall. But one that will perhaps stand out for its sheer size, versatility, and scope. One that will always be remembered, at least by the 100,000 men of the United States Strike Command who were there in May of 1964, was Exercise Desert Strike. <laughs>